Back on the Young Turks. I'm your host, Jane Huger, and we are now going to talk to Congressman John Yarmouth. He's uh, from Kentucky's 3rd District. Congressman Yarmouth, welcome back to the Young Turks. Hey, great to be back with you. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, before I get to the economy and jobs, which is uh, what I know we want to talk about, I've got to ask mm -hmm. you a question about what's happening in the Senate on this health care uh, <laughs> issue. Now, they... They're now saying the public option doesn't look doable, uh, but let's not get back into that. Let's not worry too much about that. I want to right. get your thoughts on um, on the other com the new compromise they're offering, which is expanding Medicare to 55. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I, you know, th th this is actually uh, probably exactly what we need. I mean, this really is a robust public option because you're talking about the same kind of standards for pricing that would have been in the in the robust public option earlier. The only difference here is you're not extending it to everybody. But uh, clearly in terms of, those, for those of us who really think we ought to end up in a single-payer system, this is a far better compromise than a, than a very weak public option. Well, uh, because it brings more people into it brings more people into the into the public system. It actually helps stabilize Medicare. I mean, I can't believe these fools are saying this could jeopardize Medicare. You're bringing in healthier people who will help balance the um, the the more intensive users of of healthcare that are in the older population. So I think it's a it's a terrific compromise. Uh, it's not what everybody would want because we've still got all those people between you know 27 now and and then 55 who would be buying insurance in the exchange. But again, the, the, um, I think this, this sets us on a course, I think, and that's the right direction. Uh, the, here's the problem, Congressman Yarmouth. My mm -hmm. prediction earlier in the show was that they're not going to do that. They're, they're going to <laughs> they're gonna make you compromise again. And what they're going to say is, oh, yeah, yeah, take people uh, above 55, but only the ones we don't want to cover, the ones that have pre-existing conditions, need some sort of catastrophic coverage, et cetera. So take the sickest yeah. people from 55 to 65. That'll be the compromise. And well, the, yeah, I don't, I don't exactly know how you'd do that. Uh, you'd run into all sorts of probably civil rights issues if you tried to do that. But, um, again, I think it's, it's a very, very promising approach, and uh, let's, see, let's see where it goes. All right. That's, that's a positive note. So, uh, it, <laughs> no, and, and I really I think your perspective is very important, so I'm uh, glad to get that from you. All yeah. right, so now let's talk about the economy and jobs. Uh, obviously, the president's under fire to create more jobs to get the economy going uh, quicker, but he's also under this some kind of weird fire where he should do nothing, according to the Republicans, except cut taxes. So, <laughs> and then at the same time, control the deficit. So, yeah. so none of that I mean, makes the, any Republicans sense. Republicans are amazing. The Republicans are amazing. They think that if you give a tax break or a tax cut that it doesn't make the deficit worse. They just, I, I don't get their math. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that many of them majored in math. If you eliminate, if you do, do reduce tax revenues either with a cut or by giving a tax deduction or a tax credit, you are a, you are worsening the deficit. And but they don't they don't uh, really care much about intellectual consistency in their argument. So now the thing is, Representative Armith, I do care about the deficit, right? Mm -hmm. Now, but at the same time, I get the urgency of our current recession, obviously. So how do we balance yeah. those two things? Right, and 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 the only thing you know, I've, for the last three months. Every business person I've talked to, I've asked, what should we do about creating jobs? What ideas do you have? And basically, nobody has any good ideas. Uh, the, the fundamental problem in our, in our economy is that we're 75% consumer-based. We're based on cons consumer spending. And until we can increase the demand, then businesses aren't going to hire people. And while I think uh, infrastructure development and spending is a great public policy. It really only stimulates jobs in one sector, and that's the construction trade. So and there are a lot of people losing jobs in the service economy and in the in kind of the creative society and advertising agencies and throughout the rest of the, the economy, and we have to worry about that as well. Um, so, you know, I, I applaud what the president's doing, but we've got to do more, you know, and, and health care, I think, is a huge part of it, because as I tell all my people, every dollar that goes to health care, when, when health care is inflating at 15% a year, as it is this year, every dollar that goes to health care is a dollar. It's not being spent on a Ford, it's a dollar that's not being spent on a GE refrigerator, it's a dollar that's not being spent, uh, and, you know, in, in my economy, on brown form and bourbon. <laughs> I mean... 
and, and people have to come to grips with this. Health care reform is a vital part of job creation because all those money, all that money that's being spent on health care is being taken away from the disposable income of the vast majority of the American people. And that's the big consumption gap we have in this country. Uh, we're talking to U.S. Congressman John Yarmouth, and I mean, that's, look, you and I happen to agree on a lot of things. That's why I like talking mm -hmm. to you, but uh, those are really smart <laughs> points. I mean, at least I think they are, because I agree with them. But mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, as I look at the jobs uh, program that the uh, president is suggesting, it really it stimulates jobs in the construction field, but I I'm at a loss. I, I don't know what to tell the audience, because I'm supposed to have uh, all the smart ideas on this program, as to how we <laughs> stimulate jobs in other fields. Uh, and that's a, it's a tough nut to crack. It is. I mean, it's tough. And, you know, and, and I hate to, to uh, agree with Republicans at all, but there is a limit to what, Republic, what, to, to what government can do in stimulating the economy. And the tools that are normally available to the government, which are reducing interest rates, um, are basically, or cutting taxes, um, are not available to us. We, we're already charging as, uh, basically nothing for money, and uh, taxes are actually very low. Uh, and so there's really not much we can do to stimulate the economy except two things. One is I think we need to make credit more widely available, particularly to small businesses, because the banks aren't lending. And secondly, we need to give the business community some predictability. Uh, that's what I hear most from, from the business people I talk to is we just want to know what the rules are. Whatever they are, we'll accommodate. We just want, we just want to know they're not going to change every year. Well, see and that, whether that's tax policy or energy policy or health care policy, and I think that makes a lot of sense. See, Congressman, that's uh, the t one of the points that I want to emphasize here, because mm -hmm. uh, people are, could, I, like, from my perspective, I get that you can't magically just, as Bush would say, uh, there's no magic wand that says jobs, <laughs> right, <laughs> in his own goofy <laughs> way, right? And, and, right. And, and there are different ways to stimulate jobs, et cetera, but... Uh, what drives people crazy and it drives me crazy is, at the same time, we see the Wall Street guys are back in business, right? And they, yeah. they took all the money and they got all the bonuses and they're still making record amount of money, but they won't lend. So then it makes me think, uh, which is reasonable, hey, we did this the wrong way, that we gave it to the wrong guys and it didn't accomplish our objective. So is there a way to fix that? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm introducing a bill next week that would uh, actually force the SBA... Small Business Administration to make direct loans to small businesses and bypass the banks and lend it to them on at the same Fed rate that the Wall Street giants get. Um, and I, I think I actually was in a meeting with Tim Guyton today, and and the administration doesn't really oppose that direct lending. They just they're a little bit concerned about the mechanism. But um, I've got I'm part of a group, the Congressional Business Owners Caucus, people who have run small businesses before, and there's widespread support there for this kind of approach. Uh, if the banks aren't going to lend, and we've, we're already, you know, SBA will guarantee 90% of them, they're still not going to lend, let's let the government do it directly. It's not, you know, most of that money's going to get paid back. We're not going to lose that money. And it can really, really have, a, I think, a great impact on, again, those, these small businesses, whether they're shops or restaurants or uh, advertising agencies, you name it. I mean, these are the types of businesses that need this kind of, of credit to, to keep going and, and to, to generate some more some more business and more jobs. That, that, so I, I, that, I think that part yeah. of it makes perfect sense because I got a mm -hmm. friend in real estate in New Jersey and he, they used to pay, you know, uh, to, they had to put down 10, 15 percent in order to start a new project. Now they have to put down 50 mm percent. -hmm. And nobody can start right. a project because nobody's got 50 percent <laughs> of the money. That, that, that's crazy, that's, right? So your exactly. plan, would, your plan would, uh, would target that. So that makes sense. Now how about the other end of it, which is the banks that got all this money and are just taking it in bonuses, can we go do some regulations over there to make sure? Because I know what they're using the money for. They're using it so that they could have more collateral so they could be make bigger derivatives bets. Can exactly. We well, the, 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 re the financial reform package, which we're going to be voting on this week in the House, I think uh, takes a, a variety of approaches to that. And I'm, I'm really excited about this bill. Barney Frank has done a great job of putting it together. Uh, because it regulates the derivatives market, all those crazy gambling schemes that um, AIG and the other big companies put together that, that provided absolutely no uh, benefit to society, but, but essentially except putting us at, at systemic risk of <laughs> the financial system. Uh, so we regulate those. We set up a mechanism so that when these companies get so big and, get, and take too much risk that the government has the authority to break them up so they don't threaten the financial system, 
And then we actually have some also some regulations on that require uh, shareholder votes on compensation packages. So we go at it in a lot of different ways at, at all the problems you mentioned. So um, I think this is going to be a real victory for the American people. One of the other things that I think we ought to watch, and uh, Peter DeFazio from Oregon has a proposal in to uh, levy a transaction fee on uh, massive stock transactions. And this is not for the average mom pa who's investing in their 401k or their mutual fund, but these are the people who trade millions of shares trying to catch that quarter of a point um, twist. And it basically, again, provides no good for the economy. But they play these games. We're going to, Peter's bill would impose a um, quarter of a percent tax on that. It yields $150 billion a year. And it would stop a lot of these crazy, manipulative trading schemes that, again, don't provide any benefit for society. So um, uh, the administration is not real big on it right now, but I think there's going to be a lot of public support for doing that. Well, so that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about, th three specifics, and you mentioned two of them. One is the financial transaction fee. The other one is mm -hmm. the, the shareholder giving the shareholders actual power over the companies that they own, as, as it right. should be <laughs> in capitalism. Maxine Waters introduced that. And then the third is this, uh, the loophole for foreign um, uh, derivatives. It was like the, basically a $50 trillion loophole uh, that right. it, it appears right. Geithner had put in there. So uh, all three of those, in doing the right thing, do uh, you think it's going to pass? Do you think DeFazio's, Waters, et cetera, is there, are all those going to pass the House? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any question about that. I think there's, there's widespread support for that. For all these, this whole package. Now, the Senate again is a mystery. I mean, it's like Alice in Wonderland over there. But um, we'll see what happens there. But I'm, I'm pretty confident the House is going to pass it by a pretty good margin. So all those get the right regulations get passed through the House. At, at which point, if when he gets blocked up in the Senate, we're going to need the president to step in. Now, he didn't do it on the public option. Flat out, positively, 100 percent did not do it. Right. So now, Geithner Absolutely. seems to. Absolutely. And Geithner seems to be fighting you on a couple of these already. It was his loop, loophole in the first place. He doesn't like mm -hmm. the financial transaction fee. So what do we think is going to happen here? Is the president going to do the same thing he did with the public option here and back the, the people with power and money, or is he uh, going to be on our side? Well, um, uh, we had Secretary Geithner in the Ways and Means Committee day. He met with the Democrats, and we basically said, uh, you know, you want our help on stuff? You're going to have to stand up and give us cover. You're going to have to take some leadership roles in this. I mean, you being the administration. And it, the, the committee was pretty forceful with him. And, and I think he got the message. The president's got to stand up. I mean, I, I think he began to the last couple of days. He's taken on uh, the Republicans a little bit and not letting them get away with just kind of, kind of blaming, blaming the Democrats and, and him for all this stuff when they created the problem. So uh, I think he's shown a little spine. I think those numbers, the poll numbers, when he's down around 50 percent now probably have given him some uh, resolve, and, and I hope so. He's going to need to do it. I mean, he has the bully, bully pulpit. And, and the one thing that, that, you know, I mean, your show is obviously very different. You give us time, we can talk about these issues in depth. The vast majority of the media, you know, it's, you're talking about very, very complicated things, and, when, and the media can't do them justice. So the simplistic rhetorical uh, notions that the Republicans are great at are the things that gain traction. So the only thing that can combat that is a really, really strong voice in the White House, and I hope he, I hope he develops that. And he, he's got, I mean, he's the man. He's got to do it. And that is, as I've said before, the central drama of our times, uh, whether yeah. Barack Obama will develop that strong voice. Uh, because yeah. if he doesn't step up here, they, all these things die in the Senate. So, yep, you're absolutely right. All right. Uh, Congressman Johnny Armour, with a great conversation. We really appreciate you joining us on the Young Turks. Good. Great to be with you again. Right. Take care. Thank you. Young Turks.